Joints getting the text set up. All right. Welcome, everyone. Great to have you here. Uh, my name is Amy Antonucci, and I am chair of the board of New Hampshire Peace Action. I'm here to welcome you tonight, December 18th, 2023. For over, for over 40 years, New Hampshire Peace Action has been educating, mobilizing, and organizing to build a more peaceful and just future for all. In that spirit of respect, we'd like to start by taking a moment with an, an acknowledgement that we are doing our work on Nidakina, the traditional ancestral homelands of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people. We honor with gratitude the land, the waterways, and those people who have been in relationship throughout the generations. Uh, tonight is being co-sponsored, by the way, by the American Friends Service Committee New Hampshire program, which works to nourish a growing movement of people calling for social, racial, and economic justice. Quick reminder on Zoom etiquette, we are really love it when you keep your video on so we can connect and see folks. Um, we do have everyone muted, and um, later there might be a, a chance to ask questions, but using the chat is a great way to get that started. We get a lot more questions in. Um, okay, so tonight we, how are we doing? Has Odelia appeared? We don't see her yet. Uh-oh. I think my colleague Hassan can jump on if she isn't able to join. I'm just texting her now. <laughs> um, Someone seems to have accidentally, Bill, you have shared screen and I don't think you meant to. I wonder if I can, yeah, I can stop it. There we go. Don't know what happened there. Okay, well, you work on that, Sarah. I'll slowly introduce you while you have a moment. So folks, o Odelia Mater is supposed to join us, but she had she was injured yesterday, hurt her knee or something. So we know that she had a doctor's appointment and, and things got a little thrown off for her. So we're hoping that she can join, but Sarah is going to try to get someone on the call who can talk specifically about the, the situation, um, the ceasefire call Palestine and Israel issues. And let me tell you about Sarah to start with. So Sarah Freeman Wolpert grew up in New Hampshire. We welcome her back. She now works as the Deputy Director of Strategic Advocacy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. She leads a national, national network of 138 advocacy teams in 47 states. The advocacy teams are comprised of peace advocates who work to advance federal policies to promote peace, diplomacy, and demilitarization around the world. I will say right now that I am on one of the New Hampshire advocacy team, along with Sarah Smith, and where'd Jenna go? In the OIC Rod. And uh, one thing we're gonna be telling you a couple times tonight is that we would welcome you to join the New Hampshire team if you are interested. You don't, um, yeah, well, we can tell you more about that. Sarah, are you ready to get started talking about the teams? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to, to get started. And I just texted my colleague, Hassan El Tayeb, who leads FCNL's Middle East policy work. And he's, I think, going to be able to jump on in a couple minutes. So um, fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, hi, everybody. It's good to see you. And I see some familiar names and faces. Um, my name's Sarah Freeman Wolpert. I work at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, doing a lot of our grassroots work on um, peace and justice and federal policy. But I grew up in Pembroke, New Hampshire. I went to Pembroke Academy, right across the street from where Sarah Smith lived. And so I went to Concord Friends Meeting growing up with Sarah and other Quakers in Concord. Um, and my parents still live. My mom's in Concord and my dad lives in Henniker. So it's always nice to 
hang out on Zoom with, with everyone from New Hampshire. Um, I work now in our DC office uh, with FCNL and I lead the FCNL advocacy teams, as Amy mentioned, which is a grassroots network of essentially chapters that are in 47 states around the country, many of whom collaborate with groups like Peace Action. I know in New Jersey, the New Jersey Peace Action folks are really connected to the advocacy team there, New Hampshire, of course, and other states. Um, and these teams work with FCNL's lobbyists and policy staff over the course of uh, each calendar year to advance one legislative campaign, um, trying to advance a piece of legislation, trying to get amendments passed to the NDAA or trying to pass a piece of legislation, add more co-sponsors or more voters in support of a, legis of a piece of legislation. Um, and I've been at FCNL for about five and a half years. I started in 2018. Um, before that, I lived in Bosnia and Herzegovina and was studying um, post-conflict transition and how people engage in peace activism and, and nonviolent social movements in uh, conflict-affected societies. So um, yeah, it's nice to be talking with you all, and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more about what we do with the advocacy teams at FCNL, what we've been working on over the past year, and what we're going to be focused on in 2024 for those of you who might be interested in advocating with us in the new year. Um, but I'm also hoping to have one of my colleagues join who can share a lot more about what FCNL is doing right now on a ceasefire and specifically related to a permanent ceasefire um, that we're advocating for in the conflict that's especially affecting people in Gaza and in Israel and Palestine more broadly. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen on FCNL's social media, but we recently wrap the building in a new banner. Uh, we have a banner on FCNL's facade because the building faces the Senate office buildings. So as senators are walking to work, they pass the FCNL office. And um, many years ago, right after the attacks of September 11th, um, we hung a banner in front of the building facing the Senate that read, war is not the answer. If you've seen that bumper sticker or that sign that was right in the wake of the attacks when we were um, preparing to invade Afghanistan. Um, and so now the banner that we just dropped last week in front of the building reads uh, ceasefire now right across the building facing the Hart Senate office. So um, that's been a really amazing thing to be involved with. And we've had advocacy team members all across the country who are advocating for a ceasefire. I think we're up to 63 members of Congress now who have publicly called for a ceasefire. Um, and I can share some more about that if Hassan doesn't join. Uh, we also have some resources and trackers on the website. And I know for a fact that Senator Shaheen is one of the most important uh, voices on this and, and that Hassan is really hoping to get her to support the Van Hollen Amendment, uh, which is, uh, she's one of the people on this short list um, who we're trying to get to support conditional, you know, conditioning for aid to Israel um, so that we can really try to uh, end some of the violence and put an immediate stop to some of the civilians who are being killed. Um, so what I want to just start by talking about is the advocacy teams program specifically that I work on. I know that some of you are involved. I see Jenna as well, Amy and Sarah, of course, and I think probably several others uh, who've done advocacy with the advocacy team in the past. Um, the advocacy teams program is really designed on a model that a few other organizations use to uh, equip and support people all around the country to do like a really high level of advocacy, which is pretty unusual for congressional staff to have groups of organized constituents reaching out regularly over the course of a year, requesting meetings, um, doing in-district drop-bys to congressional offices, um, trying to set up conversations with district directors, scheduling multiple phone calls at the same on the same day or the same week, so this kind of organized advocacy we found has the effect of um, essentially giving the impression, rightly so, to hundreds of congressional offices that there's a groundswell of support on a specific issue all around the country. So last year, the advocacy teams were focused on ending U.S. support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. And we had hundreds of people going into their congressional offices the first few weeks of the year, um, asking them to contact the original sponsors of the bill. Um, Congresswoman Jayapal was one of those members. And I think within a couple of weeks, one of Jayapal's staff said that the Congresswoman told them, 
the Quakers are pounding down our doors because it had, you know, this impression that there were so many members reaching out to her office saying, I want to sign on to the bill. I need to see the language. I want to bring it to my staff. What's going on? Why are all my constituents contacting me? Um, and that's been something really encouraging for me to see is um, the amount of action that it takes to um, essentially trigger a meeting in a congressional office is actually pretty low. If they've got five or six phone calls on an issue in a day, if it's not something they're hearing a lot about, um, that sort of flips a switch where the office has to sit down and have a strategy meeting about how they can respond to those questions. So I found that this kind of organized advocacy has a really um, high sort of return for the amount of work that people put in. And, and I've definitely seen that with the New Hampshire folks and with the other advocacy teams around the country in terms of what we've been able to really achieve. Um, the advocacy team started back in 2015, um, focused on uh, trying to secure the Iran deal and then worked on repealing the 2002 Iraq war authorization for several years. We've worked on Pentagon spending, We've worked on diplomacy with Iran and preventing war with North, North Korea. Um, and then we've now worked on Yemen. And this past year, we were working on uh, increasing federal investments to peace building accounts through the appropriations process, um, which was a really interesting way to see the way that we kind of positioned this and heard people talk about this with their members of Congress is if war is not the answer, what is, you know, what are some of the positive things that we can try to do? to invest in more diplomacy and more local peace builders who can get a sense of what's happening on the ground in their communities and how can we direct more resources and more support to those people who are actually tapped into those local contexts and doing the work every day. Um, so we were able to actually protect so far um, two out of three in the House and two out of three in the Senate of those peace building accounts from any kind of proposed cuts, even with really high budget cuts and, and sort of draconian measures this year. Um, and we were able to hear also from a member, a number of members of Congress that they learned about peace building for the first time because they had so many people around the country um, who were, you know, knocking on their doors, talking about peace building, sharing stories from local peace builders. Um, and just on time, as my colleague Hassan has just called in, um, I think he probably ran back from wherever he was um, to talk to everyone here in New Hampshire, because I know he's excited to talk to you all about Senator Shaheen. Um, but one of the things that we've done, although this year we were really focused on our peace building ask, was, of course, after the attacks on October 7th and then this um, massive uh, humanitarian, you know, human rights catastrophe that's been happening in Gaza in particular, um, that we've mobilized the FCNL advocacy teams all around the country to call for Congress um, and for members of Congress to urge for a permanent ceasefire. So there's a ton of resources on FCNL's website. Um, Hassan and our program assistant, Odelia, have just been prolifically publishing resources and, and articles to try to get the word out there about why Congress um, should, you know, why members of Congress should feel the urgency of calling for a ceasefire. And we've had just thousands, tens and tens of thousands of people making phone calls to members of Congress. So um, without further ado, I do want to just uh, turn things over to my colleague, Hassan El Tayeb, who leads FCNL's Middle East policy work um, and has really been leading a lot of the coalition work in Washington, D.C., calling for a ceasefire um, to share a little bit more about that work. So, Hassan, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, New Hampshire Peace Action. Hope you're doing well. I had so much fun up in New Hampshire over the summer with Amy and, and so many others. So it was, uh, it was really great. I hope to get back there. So um, this is a really, really important time to have this call. Uh, we have seen absolutely horrific violence in Israel and Palestine over the past few months. But we know that this has been going on a lot longer than October 7. We know that there are systemic issues that have been in place for decades including a brutal military occupation, uh, a blockade of Palestinians, and just unchecked impunity and human rights abuses. So we've got our work cut out for ourselves. Um, so I wanted to start off by trying to just, just set the record straight. We were told from the beginning that diplomacy was impossible and that war was just inevitable, but we saw diplomacy lead to a seven day pause in fighting. Diplomacy did what war and weeks of bombing could not, which is get over a hundred hostages home 
get humanitarian aid in and stop the bombings. So I wanted to set that straight because people seem to be a little bit confused um, and forgot that diplomacy can actually work to help ease everybody's suffering, whether or not they're Israeli or Palestinian. On the other hand, over the weekend, people saw that three Israeli hostages were actually killed by the IDF this weekend, mistaken for combatants. So I think that's just important to keep in our minds and keep in our hearts. Um, so what, what's going on now? I mean, I don't need to go over ad nauseum on the humanitarian situation, but people have been following. It's horrific. Almost 20,000 Palestinians have been killed, about 50,000 wounded. Uh, over a million people have been displaced. I mean, it's just a nightmare. And about 70% of the people impacted are women and children. And this is just, you know, absolutely heartbreaking. It's not needed. It's not making anybody safe. So what FCNL and Peace Action and really so many people around the country have been calling for is an immediate ceasefire. We want a ceasefire to protect civilians. We want a ceasefire to get the hostages home with their families where they belong. They don't belong in Gaza right now. They belong with their families. We need a ceasefire to end the stem of hate that's just just engulfing everything. We saw, you know, attacks on Jewish uh, communities. We saw that horrific attack on the, the three Ramallah Friends School students, uh, uh, the alumni. Um, and we're just it just goes on and on. Folks are getting doxxed for even mentioning that they support Palestinian human rights. And, you know, so we, we just want to put an end to that ceasefire now. We also want a ceasefire to end the horrific, uh, you know, violence that's happening, not just in Israel, Palestine, but around the region. We've got hostilities uh, escalating in Lebanon. Uh, that front is opening up and just getting worse and worse. We have a real issue there. Obviously, Syria and Iraq, there have been over 90 attacks on U.S. personnel in the past two months. That, that's got to shock everybody. We've also got Yemen popping off. Um, the Houthis are, you know, attacking ships, taking hostages, uh, and, and that situation's escalating. We've just seen that the U.S. is putting together a task force to try to, you know, contain that that threat of the Houthis. They don't. I don't think they want a full blown war with Ansar Allah, but there is talk of using military force. So again, all of these issues just keep stemming back to ceasefire. Now it's the only way, uh, despite what everybody tells you and. Um, you know, and they're telling us a lot these days. So, uh, okay, so obviously things are deteriorating. Uh, we had the US vote against a UN resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire, which I, you know, if I should could say it's absolutely shameful that given the humanitarian situation that the United States would oppose a ceasefire now, right, in any way, even if it's just a humanitarian ceasefire and getting the hostages home. Uh, thankfully, the UN General Assembly uh, on Tuesday last week, they voted 150 plus countries voted to support the humanitarian ceasefire. So uh, my question is, uh, Senator Shaheen, President Biden, uh, Senator Hassan, um, what do you know that 150 countries don't? That's my question. What do you know that they don't? Because everybody, the whole world is basically united against the United States and Israel right now. Okay. But we have a few senators and few members on the record calling for a ceasefire. So let's give a, a little bit of a shout out there. We've got 62 members of Congress now calling for a ceasefire. I think uh, Rep. Takano may have been the last one. So, so but I'm just telling you the advocacy that you're doing uh, in, you know, uh, in coalition and collaboration with p hundreds of thousands of Americans, if not millions of Americans across the country right now. Um, it's paying off and it's paying off big. Uh, we paved the way for that uh, brief ceasefire. Now they're talking about doing another one. I, I, I'm not sure if it's going to uh, materialize, but uh, CIA, CIA Director William Burns is actually heading to Warsaw this week uh, to have conversations with the Qataris, uh, with the Israelis and others to hopefully have another hostage exchange if anyone's even still surviving at this point. Um, okay, so what do we need to do? We have to keep the drumbeat going for a ceasefire. I don't need, need to tell you that. You already know that. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. I think direct lobby meetings is fantastic. 
social media, letters to the editor, uh, coalition statements, all the things that you've already been doing. So let's keep the pressure on. That's absolutely huge. Um, so that that's one on the ceasefire track. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions in a bit, but I'm, I'm hoping that's somewhat self-explanatory. We just got to keep uh, the, the pressure on. I know Peace Action has some resources. FCNL certainly does. FCNL.org backslash deescalate is a website we set up so people can send a quick email to Congress. Uh, calling every day is fine. Uh, you know, call, you know, before uh, lunch and, you know, before dinner, uh, you know, however many times you want to call, but keep those lines ringing. Okay, so let's talk briefly about the supplemental, and that's another piece. So we've got the ceasefire conversation, which is tied in with the humanitarian aid. But as folks know, we're about to send uh, Israel about uh, $14 billion in weapons assistance and military support. So given the humanitarian suffering, you know, regardless, we FCNL, we're Quakers, we don't support weapons to anybody of any kind. I uh, don't tell them that my mom works at a gun shop, but I'm just going to leave, just put a pin in that one. Um, uh, it's a long time family sporting goods store, but I'm just going to keep moving along. So the Senate Republicans have blocked a Democratic effort uh, a couple weeks ago, folks may have seen, um, uh, to pass an aid bill uh, for Ukraine, Israel, but they failed to secure some border compromises uh, that they sought in exchange. And so there was a total of about $110 billion package, $61 billion for Ukraine, again, $14 billion uh, for Israel. And the Republicans are insisting that any aid uh, to Ukraine be tied to sweeping immigration and asylum reform, which we could have a whole nother conversation about how horrific that is. Uh, but we're going to stay focused here right, right now on Israel-Palestine. Senators voted 41 to, uh, sorry, 51 to 49 against advancing the bill with 60 votes needed. They're right now in conversations. We don't even know, will this happen this week? I'm guessing that this is going to be punted till after we get back from Christmas break. Um, so so that's that's kind of where, where things are at. There's a couple policy bills, and this is where Shaheen could actually play a big role. Senator Van Hollen, and there's several different amendment ideas that we're tracking. I'm going to tell you, I think the most important one that I've seen so far um, is one by Senator Van Hollen. And it's basically, you know, it's not as far as I would like to go, but considering where the Senate is at the moment, I think it's actually a really solid proposal and quite strategic. Uh, it, it calls for US law and international law to be respected with regards to this aid bill. And so it's a, it's a conditioning amendment. And it, it also requires that the federal government, that the Biden administration and the State Department report on whether or not these, uh, these weapons and this military aid is being used uh, with respect to international and US law, which is really huge. Just one point of history, I think, I don't know if folks remember, but uh, Shaheen and Young put together an amendment in 2018 to require the same of Secretary of State Pompeo to make sure that uh, the Saudis were, you know, acting in accordance with international and U.S. law and protecting civilians. Well, they weren't, and they hit a school bus killing 40 children. Secretary of State Pompeo came out three weeks later and said he made the public certification that they were obeying the law. And then folks may remember what came next is they passed the Yemen war powers resolution and actually cut off in-flight refueling for Saudi warplanes. So these kind of reporting requirements, they don't seem like enough uh, and, they, and they aren't, but they can lead to other things that helps us move other legislation, which I think is really important. So getting Senator Shaheen to co-sponsor that, one other thing I'll say about that is she signed a letter with Senator Van Hollen on November 8, um, saying that international law should be respected with regards to US weapons. So we think that she's a hot target and should be on that resolution or sorry, on that provision with Senator Van Hollen. So that that's the first provision that I wanna, and then if it's all right, uh, you know, moving past the supplemental, there's one more thing I wanted to chat about, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, 
Senator Sanders, our buddy from Vermont, may not be quite on the ceasefire train. That's another conversation. Uh, he's called for a humanitarian ceasefire, which is good. But again, problematic views. A lot of people um, you know, think that the only way is to eradicate Hamas and then to start fresh. Well, newsflash, that ain't happening. You're not going to have peace in Israel-Palestine without involving all political parties in civil society. It's just not going to happen. Diplomacy is the only way out of this mess. It's always been that way, and we need the political will. But putting that aside, he did something really fantastic, which is invoke Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act. Uh, we, at, we at FCNL, we've maybe coined the term 502BB. Um, so if, if you want to use that and let it catch on, that's fantastic. Just really quickly, this is a historic resolution. We've never seen a vote on this, and we've never seen it invoked on Israel before. It's a two-step process. So Senator Sanders, just like in the War Powers resolution, he can force the entire chamber to vote on, uh, on trying to get more transparency on, uh, on human rights for Palestinians and the way Israel has been conducting this war. Um, and also their activities in the West Bank. And that's what he's intending to do. And I, there's going to be a floor vote centering Palestinian human rights in January. This to me is an all hands on deck moment. I, um, I published an article in Just Security. I don't know if Sarah, you can throw that in the chat. Um, and I think it's absolutely uh, critical that we, you know, on top of the ceasefire work, on top of the Van Hollen Amendment, that we also take a little time to prioritize building up some support uh, for this 502B resolution. Just, just a word on how it works, and then maybe I can pass it for some questions if people have them. Uh, it, I do lay it out in this article. But basically, one, you force the vote. You only need 51 senators. And if you get 51, it requires the State Department to produce a report within 30 days on the human rights practices and US military aid to that country in question. In this case, it's Israel. So when the report comes back, Congress then can force another vote expedited. So they don't have to wait for Senator Schumer. They don't have to wait for Biden. They don't have to wait for Senator Cardin or anybody. They can just force the vote to either restrict, condition, or completely halt altogether military aid to Israel. So. This is historic, unprecedented, never been done before, and we have a real opportunity to have a, a, a high profile floor debate and vote in January. So with that, we got our work cut out for ourselves. I hope everyone's heart is doing OK. I, I think that's really important this holiday season. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply distressed about what's going on. I'm worried, especially what's going to happen during this Christmas break while uh, folks are around the world are celebrating with their families. Palestinians will be, you know, you know, removing rubble from their homes, from their families, uh, trying to, you know, scra scrape together some food to, to feed their, their friends and family. Uh, and also Christians are not celebrating uh, Christmas in the Holy Land uh, in solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. So something to keep in mind. Let's keep the pressure on. And with that, maybe I can end here and take some questions. Thank you so much, Hassan, and thanks for, for jumping in with us um, tonight. Um, yeah, tough times. That is a lot of great information. I already see at least one um, question. I'll start with that, and then folks can keep putting them into the chat. Um, okay, so David wanted to ask, what are alternative ways to encourage Palestinian self-rule? while Hamas wrongdoers are held accountable? Well, um, that's a great question. That is the question. So what happens after a ceasefire, right? Like, how, how do we move forward? Well, one, I think we have to keep repeating it. There's no military solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict, only a diplomatic and political one. You know, I think a permanent ceasefire is most likely going to be reached through a temporary pause in hostilities that possibly lead to hostage exchange, and that turns into a longer term deal. And while this is happening, you need a solution to the overall conflict to be pushed forward through diplomatic channels simultaneously in order to holistically address the root causes uh, for terrorist activities in the first place. 
That's the occupation. That's impunity for human rights abuses. This is a resistance movement embedded in a population and only by addressing the, those political questions diplomatically are we going to really be able to finally move forward. Anything else just ain't going to happen. As far as holding people accountable, there we have diplomatic channels for that. You have the International Criminal Court, but we have to we can't just apply that to to Hamas. We have to apply that to anybody that's abusing human rights. And honestly, uh, the way the law is written, you know, the administration officials would also be, uh, you know, vulnerable to such a prosecution should, should it happen. Uh, Israeli officials and the Hamas officials uh, who perpetuated a really horrific attack on October 7th. So we, I think we have to start thinking about this in a more holistic, balanced way. And and look to uh, and one other thing I will say is that um, you know I'm you know while I've never experienced personally terrorism, members of my family have uh, have been uh, killed by ISIS uh, in Syria. Really horrific tragedy, and so I you know we we understand a little bit about what's going on and counter terror experts will say that the way you actually stop terrorism, which is what we want, we don't want violence, is you have to win over the population and separate them from more extremist ideology and extremist views. And you do that by creating a pathway uh, for self-determination, human rights, dignity. You know, we have to stop these settlements. We have to you know, take care of Al-Aqsa and make sure that Palestinians have access. Uh, we have to lift the blockade. We have to open up movement and access and then holistically address the conflict. And um, I, I just don't see another way um, because of the nature of this conflict. You know, Hamas is not ISIS. ISIS is not Hamas. So these are totally different things. Uh, but some of the, there are some concepts that apply is that you have to remove root causes of, uh, of what's driving people uh, into the arms of more extremist ideology. Um, and I'll say that Hamas is not the only actor in Gaza. You also got Islamic Jihad, which is responsible for, you know, a lot of the hostilities and violence that we saw. So, so I, there's more I could say, but maybe I'll stop there. Okay, here's one. At what point could one say that the Oslo Accords failed? I mean, you know, some people argue that, that it just wasn't a realistic framework to begin with um, and that there wasn't a willingness to actually, you know, pursue peace. You've got lots of statements from Benjamin Netanyahu and others in the government right now that, uh, you know, purposely tried to undermine peace in a lot of different ways. Some points of the Palestinians is undermining it as well. Um, you know, we can only look at what's happening and the massive power and balance. Uh, you know, FCNL, we're no longer like while we still support a two state solution, if if uh, that's the way the parties want to go. But we've decided to adopt completely a human rights frame so we can move forward. And because we think like peace cannot be achieved without justice and accountability. Um, and that's that's so important that we get that fundamental uh, these fundamental human rights for Palestinians. With that, I'm actually, I'm uh, Bridget and myself, the executive director or general secretary of, of FCNL, she and I are actually heading to Israel and Palestine on January 11th. And we're gonna be there for a couple weeks. Uh, we're gonna visit, we're in, you know, maybe we could do another session after we get back, inshallah, everything's safe. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I can, you know, say, tell you more about what I learned on the ground. I did go, go there uh, in 2022. And I'll say firsthand, my God, the settlements all over the West Bank, the infrastructure, the roads, the outposts, it's just never ending. And all these Palestinian communities are completely surrounded. I felt claustrophobic for them, that they have no space to breathe. There's no place to build. They're not getting approved for their infrastructure. And it, life is just absolutely miserable. And people are losing hope. And, and you can see why. So what we have to do in the US is continue to build power and, and support the ceasefire, but also support the next step, which is almost more important, addressing the root causes and building the power to kind of carry this over the finish line. The thing we have going for us 
is that more people care about this issue, uh, you know, than probably ever before in, in recent memory in the past few decades, at least. So this is new resurgence that we should be tapping into and we're doing it. Thanks, Hassan. Um, I want to ask, well, you know, what you're talking about, particularly the human rights framework, we have examples of that in the world, having made progress. Um, Northern Ireland comes to mind, South Africa comes to mind. Um, and I'd love to help people like focus on how it can be done, because I am just hearing from so many people, what else can we do kind of it, like our imaginations have gone to nothing. Could you talk any about, you know, how to help people or what we might reference, what we might to, you know, yeah, yeah go ahead. That, that, no, no, Amy, that's so smart to bring up these other examples. I think the Northern Ireland example is actually very relevant, obviously different, right? None of these situations are a perfect carbon copy uh, of one another. But we were able to achieve, uh, you know, a demilitarization of an armed group through a political process. That political process folded some of those members of the armed group into uh, the new government, uh, you, you know, and that's kind of what we need right now, you know, and that's exactly what we need right now. Um, and Hamas, you know, this is a complex organization. I, I just really quickly, there's a military wing. It's got about 30,000 or so soldiers. You know, this is a population of 2.2 million people, albeit. So you got, you know, 30,000 soldiers. You've got a political wing, you know, that that's, you know, kind of in government. Not all of them were on board with the attacks. It's kind of clear from the reporting that there's not complete unity and a lot of disunity. Uh, then you have a governmental body which does the trash does you know just collections does like basic civil service uh um you know activities and then you've got general supporters and and really it's it's an ideology uh, built on the idea that they have to repress occupation or like push back and resist occupation so so we have to understand exactly kind of what's going on and what what are the drivers um, and then look to other examples around the world where we've achieved, uh, you know, success diplomatically and nonviolently. Um, you know, obviously after you know struggling and, and resorting to violence uh, at times, uh, you know, and but continually push for peace. And that, that's our that's our task right now, and it's a big one. And you know, this might be one of those situations where we might not know um, the shade of the of the seeds there's some saying that you guys know about okay there's there's trees there's shade we might not know it um and that that's sad but i think you know we have to stay focused here and you know and and we're not in gaza you know there are people right now that are living unimaginable horrors and we owe it to them to keep pushing and you know one thing on the other question that was was said is that um you know peace efforts as far as like how to hold people accountable and support self rule uh, Palestinians want that 61% of Palestinians when polled they want nonviolent resistance uh, majority of Palestinians didn't didn't want you know or not didn't approve of Hamas to begin with so the way I think we support that is actually by you know rolling back some of the things that are harming peace which are the settlements, which is the blockade, which is Al-Aqsa. And then, and, then, and then if we get that ceasefire, if and when, which I believe we will, it's just a matter of what Gaza will look like after the fact, uh, you know, peace efforts need to be bolstered through internationalism, multilateralism, ensuring that all parties are held accountable while negotiations are actually happening and that the ceasefire doesn't break, you know, We've considered UN and other international peacekeeping forces, potentially an administrative force for a gradual transition to Palestinian, man uh, Palestinian management through periodic elections. And that's really where we want to go. You know, so we, I think we should hold that out there and then know that we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Great. Um so I'm going to ask this by Sarah, and then I'm going to add a little bit. So Sarah's asking, 
It is so easy to get lost in the weeds about the politics. How can we keep the focus on the humanitarian and human rights issues? And before you answer that, the way I'm seeing it is there's sort of two competing things that in a way I feel like this is the moment to educate people about all sorts of stuff that's been going on. Uh, but then you can get into this like hole when really ceasefire needs to be the biggest idea. So how to balance those things? The moment of, of helping people understand what's happening there, because some people are just totally, you have no idea versus, you know, staying focused on human rights. Yeah, that's, that's really a great question. Um, you know, we have a few resources that we've put out there on talking to family about this issue that might be relevant. I know American Friends Service Committee has also put, out, put together some docs. So number one, get yourself educated. Really understand this issue. Make sure you, you know, you're reading about it. Those, those resources may, we can drop in the chat soon. Um, might be a good place to start. Uh, Peace Action might already have some. So get yourself kind of co comfortable with it. And, and you know, number one, when you're debating someone, you know, if someone's willing to debate you on this issue, they're probably, hate to say it, but a lost cause. You know, you, you might not be able to convince them, but you might be able to convince everybody that's watching that debate. And if you have know your stuff and keep your cool, you are gonna convince others and might even convince them and, uh, and it'll sneak up on them. So that's one. Number two, ceasefire now is the, a great rallying cry. And there's a, a million reasons that, you know, I went through you know, a handful of them, uh, why we need one. Um, and it can be the human rights issue. It can be like to start the political process. So that's a, just a really good anchoring message right now uh, where you can kind of bring up the politics and the humanitarian situation. You don't need to be a PhD, uh, despite the fact that we want you to get educated in, in all this. You know, you don't need to have a PhD or have written a dissertation or, uh, you, you know, need to be an FCNL lobbyist uh, to, to, to work on ceasefire. This is a very simple ask. We always want a ceasefire. We want a ceasefire anytime people are shooting each other. You know, we want a ceasefire like here, right here in our schools that keep getting shot up by, by people with AR-15s. Like we want the guns to be silent so people can keep talking and working out their issues nonviolently. Um, and that's the only way that really is the only way that this is gonna, you know, gonna happen. Um, and, you know, mentioning the humanitarian and human rights issues in that context is great, but keep pivoting back to ceasefire. Um, I think we have time for one more. This is Bill. Um, and this kind of relates to the last one around messaging, really. So Bill is asking, is the Israel-Palestine situation a war or a conflict or an occupation? Doesn't the official narrative often ignore and mislead about the historic occupation of the West Bank and the siege in Gaza? Occupiers have responsibilities to protect the occupied while the occupied have a right to resist. So, Yeah, that, that's a really good flag. Um, so as an occupying, occupying power, Israel is prohibited under international law from collectively punishing the civilian population of the Gaza Strip. 100%. This is an occupation, and we have to understand this whole context through that lens. Doesn't mean Hamas is right to kill civilians. That's not actually true. That's a war crime as well and should be condemned. We, we were condemning that from day one, and I think everybody should. But we have to understand that collectively punishing everybody in the Gaza Strip is wrong and it's against international law. Um, and, and as such, Israel is obligated to take all the measures in its power to protect civilian life, property, and the population at large. And, um, you know, just, you know, even before October 7, before this collective punishment, this onslaught, you had 50% unemployment in Gaza. 80% of the water was not potable. You had 80% of the population that depended on humanitarian aid to, to live and get daily needs met. You also had people that had cancer and that couldn't leave and get treatment. People dying for no reason things that we can cure right here. 
you, you know, it, it's absolutely absurd. And, you know, we have to understand this whole context through that power lens, uh, really that there's a huge power imbalance. And the question is, what do we want? We want peace for everybody in the region, right? And we also want to make sure that the U.S. is not complicit in any human rights violations. I think as taxpayers, that's our biggest mandate, right? We can't make people get along, but we can make sure that U.S. weapons aren't being used to violate human rights of Palestinians. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think that's absolutely critical. You know, people call it the Israel-Palestine, you know, you know, there's been a lot of debate. I, I try not to like dive too much in the semantics, you know, like because, you know, is it a conflict? That doesn't seem appropriate. Is it a war? Technically, yes, you can have a war between, uh, you know, uh, you know, a state of Israel and an armed group that's legally acceptable. But what we're seeing to me looks more like an ethnic cleansing. We're trying to move people, you know, off of their land. We've already just, you know, we. Israel has displaced, I, I say we because it's the United States taxpayers, I feel personally complicit, even though I'm doing everything I can to stop it. Uh, we're trying to, you know, uh, the Israelis with the help of the United States are pushing uh, millions of people out of their homes. Uh, they've completely made northern part of Gaza uninhabitable. And now they've squished all these people, uh, 1.8 million or so, into the south where they're living under horrific conditions. And now we don't even know. They might, it seems like they're trying to push them even further into the, uh, into the Sinai desert, which would, which, which would be an absolute disaster, um, you know, not just for the Palestinians, but you know, it would completely destabilize Egypt by pushing um, Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood supporters in, uh, into the Sinai, which again, could cause all sorts of problems. So uh, that can't happen, uh, you know, and, we, and we need to do everything we can uh, to, to end this violence now. So I'd like now to, to sort of shift. Um, we're, we're getting towards the end here. So what I want from both of you, I'll start with you, Hassan, is, you know, I've been on some calls with you where you have spoken about the, um, how much work is being done right now, how everywhere you go, there are people getting arrested and lobbying and that this is like a huge moment of activism um, by people who want peace. And that is, for me, has been really heartening. I wonder if you'd share a few, a little bit of that for folks here. Well, I, I know that you all are already doing it. So that's one. Thank you for your service, your advocacy. It's been incredible to watch. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, today there was a, a global day of action. Organizations around the world were partaking. Uh, I, I know FCNL, uh, we, our, our network, we've sent, maybe some of you have sent a few of those notes, but we have about half a million emails to Congress. Um, we, we put together an 80 plus national org coalition uh, our or, our coalition groups are meeting every single Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, you know, as a national uh, coalition where we're trying to you know talk strategy, share resources and materials, and then doing lobby visits across the hill with Republicans, Democrats, Independents, literally anybody that will listen. Um, and I know outside we just put ceasefire now on the side of our building, so that anytime Senator Sanders or Mitch McConnell or any of these folks walk into their offices, they have to see the word ceasefire now or the phrase. So, uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, uh, you know, Palestinian groups have been just leading the charge, doing incredible advocacy and peace action, Code Pink, Civic, Oxfam, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, I could go on and on. Uh, and it's absolutely beautiful. What I'd like to see more of though, is more people engaging electorally. Uh, and and, and sh saying, you know, not only are we going to advocate for you, but we're going to be supporting someone else in in to to run for office if this isn't happening. And I do think it is time for that conversation. We need better leadership, uh, and we need, you know, maybe maybe we take a look at who votes no on the the Bernie Sanders 502B resolution and start, you know, encouraging people to launch some primary challenges. That that's not in my FCNL capacity. Uh, that's just in my Hassan capacity. 
Thanks. I think it's important for us to remember that we are really not alone right now in this, that a lot of us don't have people in our day to day life who want to talk about it. But there's a huge amount of folks across the world who are with us. Um, and Sarah, I want to now pass it to you to talk about the advocacy teams, I will say, as a member of the New Hampshire CNL advocacy team, and I'm not a Quaker, so just so folks know, we're all welcome. Um, we have had so many lobby visits. We and Sarah, Jenna, and I have gone to Senator Shaheen's and to Representative Pappas's, and I was in a meeting with the staff for Representative Hassan on Friday. So this kind of work and getting the support from FCNL to do it has been incredible for me. Um, Sarah, can you say more about how these work and how folks can get involved? Absolutely. Yeah. And this this really ties into everything that Hassan just shared, because the whole dream of the advocacy teams when it started almost 10 years ago was essentially to build a lot of support and grassroots knowledge around specific foreign policy issues that most members of Congress just never hear about from their constituents. So it's not to say that any given year, the only thing we care about is peace building appropriations or, you know, ending U.S. support for the war in Yemen or the Iraq war authorization. But after, you know, the past eight years, we essentially have a grassroots network of, you know, 1500 people in all these different congressional districts who, you know, they're reading the news differently. They're engaging in all of these different issues. They're able to contact their members of Congress as soon as something comes up. So we're essentially building this nimble network of people who get a lot of support from FCNL's policy staff, from our grassroots team to really build this momentum around foreign policy issues, connecting those to all of the things that affect our communities so that members of Congress realize that there is a constituency for peace, essentially. That that's Hassan and I talk about this as kind of a, you know, a new wave of a peace movement that can really make members of Congress pay attention and let them know that their constituents are paying attention when they take certain actions or don't take certain actions on foreign policy issues that they're not usually held accountable to. Um, so the actual structure of the program, every month we have a national call, the first week of the month. Some of you might have been on those calls. Um, I lead those calls. Hassan often makes a guest appearance, but we have um, usually a high level speaker. So we'll have members of Congress join. We'll have the heads of think tanks or journalists or, um, you know, military veterans or people in government agencies who will come and speak from their perspective about the campaign issue that we're focused on that year. Um, and then we have a lot of time for Q&A with, you know, 300 people on Zoom from all around the country who are asking questions from the guest speaker and really diving deep into this issue to understand, you know, how they can make the most impact, where their member of Congress holds power, what's going to happen if it's standalone legislation or if it's appropriations or an amendment, um, how they can really make their voice heard in the most strategic way. Um, so that's our monthly call. Usually advocacy teams locally then also meet either in person or usually on Zoom after the national call to plan their month of action. So teams often schedule what we call lobby visits, which is just meetings with either district staff or DC staff on Zoom. Um, where they schedule, you know, 30, 45 minutes to talk with a congressional staffer to share their stories, to make their ask. We do some training for any new folks who want to get involved. We have a training every month for people to learn how to do some of those, you know, essential kind of core tasks that the team does together. Um, teams also organize outreach events. So they've been doing vigils calling for a ceasefire. They do letter writing events. They sometimes have a member of Congress come in visit the library and talk with the team about, you know, the their concerns. Um, and teams also publish in the media. So we've had, I forget how many, but maybe 130 letters to the editor published all around the country. We had three published in South Carolina last week on the same day, like in, from the same advocacy team. Um, so again, you open the newspaper and those congressional staff are like, wow, my, my constituents are talking a lot about ceasefire, but it's the same little group of people. You know, it's just um, it, it's just these skills that many people don't realize are so accessible to them and can really make members of Congress pay attention and, and can move the needle on these huge policy issues. Um, there's a ton of support from FCNL. We have 65 staff in all across the country and in our Washington office. And a lot of us are here to answer questions, to do 
you know, jump on a call, help prepare for a meeting beforehand. Um, and then the other, adv the advocacy teams also build community with each other. So um, there's different roles people play. Some like to do more media work. Some like to lead the lobby visits. Others, you know, like to do the corresponding with congressional staff. Um, but most importantly, you know, you'll have these statewide networks. So New Hampshire has folks all around the state who'd lobby together and take action together. We have, you know, in California, I think 15 different teams all up the state so they can strategize for how they're going to reach their Senate offices, how they can be most effective. And, you know, when the California advocacy teams request a meeting with their senators, they have 65 people on Zoom from all across the state of California when they meet that Senate staffer. And that makes a huge impression, just being able to show up um, and show that kind of constituent power on these issues. So um, I will say in January, we're going to January 3rd is our national call. We're going to be launching our new campaign, uh, which is going to focus on what's called the unfunded priorities lists and Pentagon spending. Um, so this is essentially the Pentagon slush fund, the Pentagon wish lists that uh, allows this kind of a closed door process where the Pentagon can route more funds into war and militarism, often for things that the Department of Defense doesn't even want. It's uh, ships that can't sail and uh, planes that can't fly. And so it's things that are really detracting a lot of money from our communities, from our federal budget, um, and often going into fueling the kinds of wars and violence and militarism that we're seeing right now in, in Israel, Palestine. So We'll learn more about that campaign in January, but we'd love to have more folks get involved. If you reach out to Amy or Sarah or Jenna, um, I'll also put my email in the chat, but um, it'd be great to have more of you join the calls and take action with the New Hampshire team. And you'll see that you know over time, uh, all of these issues are connected to each other. And so we'll see Hassan on the calls. We have other lobbyists, uh, Ursula and Alan and other staff who will talk about their portfolios and how members of Congress can can really change their positions based on this kind of advocacy. So I know we're almost out of time and folks may have more questions. So Amy, I'll just turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks. Well, we're gonna wrap up, but I know Sarah can stay a few extra minutes, um, but let's, let's have our official end here. Um, thank you so much, Sarah and Hassan, for taking the time to come here to update us, to do this work that um, is so needed in the world. We're so grateful. And thanks to all of you for coming and engaging and caring um, about what's happening enough to take action. So let me tell you a few other things. Stay in touch with New Hampshire Peace Action at nhpeaceaction.org and on Facebook to learn more about what we're working on and what programming we have coming up. And here is a little bit of a taste of that. We have a special program this week, Wednesday, December 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, with Dr. Philip Farah called Journey from Jerusalem. Dr. Farah was born in Jerusalem and lived under Israeli occupation until coming to the U.S. at age 27. He will share his story with us um, from the Holy Land during the holiday season. If you're in our area, please join our vigils. Our next one, Ceasefire Now Interfaith Vigil for Peace on Wednesday, December 20th. So actually before that program I just told you about, 4 to 5 p.m. will be across the street from Senator Shaheen's office, 340 Central Ave, Dover, New Hampshire. This is a solemn vigil hosted by AFSC New Hampshire, as well as New Hampshire Peace Action Veterans for Peace and many others. We will call for a permanent ceasefire, an end to the blockade of Gaza, and an end to U.S. military aid to Israel, and instead a commitment to human rights for all. Our next online peace and justice conversation will not be in two weeks because that is January 1st, so we are going to skip that, and instead we'll be back on January 15th, Martin Luther King Day, 7 to 8 p.m. We're going to welcome Kimberly Williams. She's the author of Dear White Woman, Please Come Home. And she's going to talk with us about authentic relationships across the racial divide. There's going to be a lot more. We have programming we're putting together, you know, more and more. This is, a, as we know, a critical time. So especially around Israel, Palestine, we're going to keep having vigils and meetings with our, our representatives and programs. So watch the um, 
and get on our email list if you're not so that you will get that straight to you as well as our weekly legislative alert. Um, note that the series is free and open to everyone, but it means a lot to us when you give financially nhpsection.org slash donate. It's in the chat too. 